we started with the idea of producing, again, uh, a hopefully reasonably good looking representative of what a video game might actually be doing kind of uh, presentation. So we started looking at you know, what can we do that would be a great application that has lots of geometry and we sort of landed on asteroids. So to give you some numbers, just to place things in context, it was a pretty short, very quick production that was eight weeks before the launch of the Turing chip. Uh, we had a team of five-ish developers. I mean, NVIDIA is always in flux, so people rotate in and out of projects. Uh, we actually hired one sculpting artist outside of NVIDIA to sculpt all the geometry that you saw. Uh, we purchased the geometry from TurboSquid. We're not ashamed of that. Uh, and everything was pretty much built from scratch. I'm not going to go through the whole list of features, but just to give you an idea, we built as close as we could make it in eight weeks to a real fully featured game engine in terms of visual features. So you've got you know, all your usual deferred TAA, PBR, HBO Plus and you know, all the soup of acronyms. Uh, some interesting things to look at, things like the physically based atmosphere on the planet and volumetric fogs. Uh, all kinds of interesting little details. So if you get the time to play with the demo, you can download it, by the way, and play with it if you have a cheering board. Um, we, we invested a fair amount of time trying to make things look pretty. In terms of actually going to the, the grind and meat and potatoes on this, so to speak, um, the geometry was sculpted in Mudbox, mud and that has one advantage. If you've used the software, you might have noticed that geometry is stored in molten curve order, which means it's sort of spatially local. So we try to leverage that. Uh, we use Catmull clock surfaces, a sort of implicit smooth level of detail, so we could extract basically all the LEDs without having anybody work on this. <laughs> Again, small team, small budget, but not a lot of time. Uh, and finally, we wrote some custom meshlet exporting plugins for Mudbox to make things more manageable on our end. Uh, a quick view of one single of the asteroids, so to give you an idea of how the level of detail progress. Uh, there's 10 of them usually, uh, which end up at you know, about 12 and a half million triangles for some of the bigger chunks out there. Uh, and it's a lot of sculpting, believe me. Uh, the poor guy has been basically sculpting his brains out for about a month. He gave us 20 individual sculptures that uh, end up totaling about five gigs of data if you include the textures. So it's a, it's, it's a fair amount of, you know, of data that the actual engine has to go through. An actual scale goes from 10 meters to 20 kilometers. That was a big thing I was trying to convey, basically, an impression in, of scale. Some of these things are gigantic. They're so big that you actually, once you get close, you don't realize that it's not actually a piece of terrain. It's still an asteroid. <laughs> and some things are pretty damn small. Uh, you can barely see them. So, of course, transitioning these LEDs, we needed some kind of LED system. So we used dithering, stochastic dithering. There's two things to keep in mind there. Uh, if you get a deferred engine, you don't have alpha blending. So you need to essentially draw twice, and you basically decide texels to turn on and off, or pixels on screen to turn on and off, and pseudo-randomly, so don't really get noticed too much. And of course, uh, the range of transitions, which is when you draw the asteroid twice, of course, has a big impact on performance. So you want this transition to be as compressed as possible. So there's a lot of hand tuning there of parameters to try to make that work. Um, how did we put it together? It's fairly simple. Imagine an infinite plane. The asteroids are in there. There's a billboard for the planet in the back. Uh, and we made a belt that sort of had these kinds of uh, dimensions. Uh, we actually pre-positioned the asteroids so they don't get straddled of each other, which is really noticeable and really annoying. Uh, we subdivided grids of sectors, again, for managing LODs and calling and all these kinds of things, sort of you know, breaking down the problems in, in orders of magnitudes. And at the edges of our grid, of course, space wraps. So if you fly high enough and fast enough, you'll start noticing patterns of asteroids around the place that were obviously uh, the same thing repeating. So again, uh, trying to explain the algorithm that we used in our task shader for calling. This is where these, this puzzle sort of puts it back, itself back together. Uh, you have about 100 sectors, these literal sections of our grid, visible in the frustum at any point. So that's actual work done on the CPU. You know, iterating over a list of 100 items, we can do that on a 2 gigahertz CPU, no problems. It's actually not much work. Um, each sector is starting four task shader dispatch calls, where we basically say, OK, here's a dispatch for the large asteroids, the medium, the small, and the tiny ones. Whoops, sorry. Um, and you've got one asteroid for each task shader dispatch. So if you've got 100,000 asteroids on screen, which is actually a conservative number for us, that means there is 100,000 task shaders that have been dispatched to the GPU by the CPU. And the reason for this is we wanted to make sure that we had enough mesh shaders for each task shader to go all the way to the top LOD that has all the triangles. Uh, 
Uh, after that, there is one to N, so N being you know, LOD dependent, meshlet shaders dispatch to cover potentially two draws of the same asteroids at two, level, two different levels of detail. Uh, let's see, did I switch something? So yeah, it's a very simple framework. Uh, it's not particularly clever, and it's far from being optimal, but again, no, no real time to experiment. We just wanted to see how far we could go with this thing. So just to break down the algorithms very briefly, uh, the task shaders uh, basically process the bounding box frestum test for each asteroid. They do a distance and a fog test, because of course we know if the asteroid is far enough, it's not gonna be visible anymore by, through the fog. And we also had a hierarchical Z depth test. Uh, so that's actually something that was disappointing and one of the learning lessons, which is the more rejection and call-in tests you keep on packing, so the more overhead you introduce doing all these tests, the less return you get on an investment because they sort of overlap each other, right? The fog test overlaps the distance test, and if you've already rejected a whole bunch of stuff, your depth buffer Z hierarchical Z test is gonna be very inefficient. So there's sort of diminishing returns in how many culling algorithms you implement. So you wanna be careful and start having multiple strategies and experiment with this stuff. Uh, the meshlet shader itself, because it often sees a much smaller portion of the asteroids at a time, uh, still does a bounding box frustum test as well. So if you've got a very large asteroid that's only halfway visible, you wanna make sure that you don't rasterize a whole bunch of meshlets. Uh, and after that, we try to add a whole bunch of things like average normal tests to discard entire meshlets that would be facing backwards. Uh, or things, again, more hierarchical Z-tests. Uh, the problem there is, again, we ran into interesting technical issues and mostly out of time. So I flag those as, this is interesting, as in homework to experiment some more. Just to give you an idea of the, the meshlet on, on a given asteroid, so here's in Maya, for instance, you can see several meshlets that are highlighted on the actual shape of the asteroid. Uh, you can see that our segmentation is definitely not good. It's based on the original Molten curve that were packed by, by Box. So there's definitely room for improvement for algorithms over here. Uh, a quick word, and I'm running out of time for our holes, so I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly. Uh, normally when you think about indexing topology for triangles, you have a uh, vertex attributes buffer. that has positions, normals, whatever. You can split into multiple buffers, but it's fairly simple to understand. And into this, you index with a 32 bits most of the time, or 16 bit index buffers, basically. Each triangle has three entries in there that reference the vertices. Uh, this is simple, the problem here is meshlets index the triangles with eight bits only, so that doesn't work. Because again, we only have very small meshlets, only small amount of triangles, so the limitations is eight bits. So you can only have 256 triangles in a single meshlet. So that means that we need to start decoupling the data a little more, and we need to index things a little bit more carefully. So the way we do this is we actually now have two levels of indirections that have, that have been added. Uh, the first one is a table on the right side of the diagram of the meshlet headers, so to speak, this, the meshlet information. And it contains things like what's your bounding box, uh, what's your safe cone angle if we're doing back face calling, uh, information about topology like number of vertices, number of triangle indices, and the offsets in the other arrays. And that's how we go through an array that contains the eight bit indices and a pointer that goes back to the 32 bit indices. And we basically fetch the indices progressively as we know that we're gonna need that information. And of course, at the very end, we reconnect everything back to the vertex attributes. So a very quick word before I leave the, the lecture to, to Rahul over here, who is sort of getting impatient because I'm eating into his time. <laughs> uh, quick do's and don'ts, uh, task shaders, do use them as much as possible. If you, even if you think that you're not drawing a whole lot, that level of indirection can often mean better parallelism, so try to work it in. Even if it does literally no logic or nothing interesting, you'll see that you often get some speed benefits. Uh, reduce the payload sa sizes, so fewer vertex attributes in particular. Quantize and pack the data as much as possible. If you can squish the size of a meshlet, I mean the memory size, which you can tell to D3D or Vulkan, if you can reduce this, this is where the performance gains are. Th this bandwidth is critical. And finally, you know, cull. Cull as much as you can everywhere you can. Any geometry that you can somehow find a heuristic to ditch before it actually makes it to the rasterizer is money in the bank in terms of performance. Uh, don't try to use the meshlet pipeline to just emulate fixed function stuff. Code to the problem, basically. Now that you have the flexibility, take advantage of it. And yes, the first steps are pretty painful because you're going to need a whole asset pipeline, a whole bunch of things in place before you can even start experimenting with this. 
but it's worth it on the other hand. I mean, you've seen the crazy amount of triangles that we were drawing over here, and we're just getting started here. Like I said, this is what we're able to do in eight weeks with a fairly simple problem. Uh, think about what you can do with vegetation, hair, all these kinds of really complicated problems that have been sort of dogging us in computer graphics for a long time.